On this episode, our very own subwoofer enthusiast, Stephen Allen Whistle, drops by. Hello and welcome to Ask the Expert. My name is Christopher and I'm your host. So, as you might can see, we've changed the venue for this episode. But don't you worry, we're still right here in Scannerwall at our HQ. With us today, we have Stephen. And Steve, can you start by telling us a little bit about who you are? I'm one of the senior acoustic designers here. Um, I've just done the last four subwoofers we've just launched. Um, we do a bit more than just subwoofers, but I've done quite a few in the past as well. So you, you know a thing or two about subwoofers? Yes. Cool. And uh, we have a lot of questions today, so I think we should just jump straight into them. Is that okay? Great. Perfect. Stephen, I think we should get started with a question about what makes a subwoofer sound uh, tight and punchy. It's from uh, Sandy. And just to paraphrase the question, it's what are the key parameters of making a subwoofer sound tight and punchy? Yeah, um, really there's only one thing and that's BL. Okay. So BL is the force factor um, in the drive unit and it's to do with the voice coil and the strength of the magnet. And the higher the BL, the more the drive unit follows the voltage from the amplifier. So when the amplifier tells the, the driver to move, it moves. And when it tells it to stop, it stops. So you can kind of say that the BL factor tells you a little bit about how well the amplifier controls the drive unit or? Uh, exactly, yeah, it's the, the way they couple together. Mm. So it, it's just when there's voltage coming from the amplifier, the driver moves. Um, and, the, and the higher the BL, the more it wants to follow that voltage okay. and the less the other electroacoustic parameters of the drive unit have influence on that. And that uh, control you have of the drive unit actually makes the, the subwoofer sound tight and punchy because when it says stop, the amplifier says stop, the, the woofer stops moving. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So BL factor is just the key parameter when you talk about tight and punchy bass. It's the most significant one, I would say, yeah. Let's go with that. Our next question, Stephen, is from uh, Brian. And he, uh, he wrote, so if we assume that you already have a really uh, good room correction system at home, mm -hmm. what would the benefit of uh, considering a sub six with its advanced uh, DSP and presets uh, be compared with considering a sub three? Yeah. The, they're two kind of different products in many ways you know the sub six is a more advanced subwoofer you know we developed the drive unit from the ground up mm. specifically for uh, maximum subwoofer performance yeah. so we've got the new cone a new diaphragm a uh, new surround to mm. allow it to move more so there's a whole load of benefits on the for the sub six over the sub three um, just pure audio performance mm. The features that we also are able to add in to the sub six over the sub three is the better integration in a 2.1 setup. Okay. So if you don't have a room correction and you don't aren't able to time align your subwoofer with your speakers because your subwoofer is in an odd location, mm. you have that ability inside the subwoofer to do that. So it's an extra level of functionality mm. and we are able to tailor the filters specifically for our products. Yeah. So it, it, you get a perfect integration, whether you're using a special 40 or an evidence platinum. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing you, you say is that even if I did have a, a room correction system at home that is really advanced and really good, I, I, it still makes sense to consider the, the, the larger sub six compared with the sub three, because there are uh, there are more benefits with that product. Completely. Just f uh, from a raw performance point of view, the Sub-6 plays louder, it plays lower. Mm. Um, it, you have the balanced drive units so it doesn't shake the, around the room yeah. when, it, when you're really playing low bass. Um, the integration with your, your main speakers, you can handle that in your processor mm. with your room correction. That's fine. So you're not just buying a, uh, a couple of presets? No, 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 you're buying a lot more than just a couple of presets. Yeah. I hope that answers your question, Brian. 
Stephen, if you already have a pair of loudspeakers that go really low, um, what is the benefit of adding a subwoofer? It's a question by Peter, and, and I think that is a really good one. It goes lower, for starters. Okay. You know, um, but I guess uh, that there's more to it than it just goes lower, right? Yes. I mean, a lot of subwoofers are used for um, movies, you mm. know, that big boom and that big bang. Um, but there's so much more to it than that. So if we take um, an evidence mm. and then we add uh, a subwoofer that's properly integrated, you know, we may only extend that response by 10 hertz, but um, the way the subwoofer integrates with, with the loudspeaker, you get so much more there's uh, often in recordings the, the 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 cues that we pick up on for localization. They're all in the in reverberation cues. Uh, just want, can you talk yeah. a little bit about re reverberation and what that is? Uh, reverberation is a fancy way of saying echoes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go if you're in your bedroom, mm -hmm. it's got a fairly low reverberation time. Mm. If you're in a cathedral that will have a very long reverberation time. Because the room is, is really big, right? It's really big, yeah. there's lots of hard surfaces, not a lot of absorption. Um, and uh, in the big spaces as well, particularly the low frequency mm. reverberation gets even bigger. Um, and when you add a subwoofer in, you're able to reproduce that rever reverberation mm. more accurately. Um, and you might think, oh, yeah, but who cares about that? But that reverberation gives you cues all the way up the frequency scale. Mm. So, you know, go back to our evidence. Evidence, you know, you put a violin on the evidence and, it, and you hear the violin, it sounds really good. Um, and you can picture it in the space. You add the subwoofer, the violin sounds more real the position becomes more pinpoint mm. um, and it's just an overall uh, more immersive experience by adding the subwoofer. And we were actually, uh, most of the time before we do an episode, we actually do an article and we were talking the, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago about this and it really struck me as quite interesting because I don't think that a lot of people actually consider that the subwoofer can add information, not just in the low frequencies, but in, in the middle and, and in the high frequency as well. Yeah. And it really does, right? Yeah, I mean, everything interacts with, the, with each other in, uh, in different ways. Mm. So, you know, uh, the subwoofer will change your perception of how the tweeter sounds mm. and the tweeter will change your perception about how the subwoofer sounds mm. and if you've got a misalignment with the integration between the subwoofer and the main speaker that will completely ruin your experience of uh, the entire of system. the entire thing yeah, yeah. Uh, not just because you've got a, a cancellation or something so adding that subwoofer is not just about you know adding a lot of punch and boom to your action movies it's it's about adding all of the information that was in that cathedral when it was recorded yeah or i mean e even if you look at modern pop, pop music or mm. rock music it's still they still use the same effects mm. you know it's not been recorded in a cathedral but they have a a, a reverb unit that they mm. add um to give you that kind of spatial feeling yeah. and it's just as valid mm. um for an artificial reverb mm. as it is for a real reverb. Mm. Um, and interesting thing for me, you know, everybody's like, oh, you know, what's your wife going to be like? You know, <laughs> I took the subwoofer home yeah. and my wife was just like, finally, yeah. music started to sound like it should. Yeah. And it's not because I've got bad speakers at home, but she's just used to real life music mm. and concert halls and things. So I guess that this long talk, if we, we had to sum it up and give uh, Peter an answer, you add so much more to your speakers when you add a subwoofer. Yes, it's not just a frequency response. Cool. Okay, Stephen, we have a question from Tim. And before I ask it to you, I just want to tell the viewers that last time on Ask the Expert, we covered room acoustics with Christopher. Yeah. And uh, from that episode, I know that, you know, 
placing speakers in a room can be a pretty big topic. Mm -hmm. And that leads to Tim's question, because yeah. he wants to know how to put his speaker, uh, his subwoofer, where to put them in his room. And as I said, it's a huge topic. Yeah. But, but could you try and help Tim out just a little bit uh, and maybe not going in way deep into detail, mm -hmm. but giving a couple of pointers for people out there to think about when they put a subwoofer into their room? Yeah, when you put your subwoofer into the room, most uh, rooms are fairly small compared to the wavelengths that are happening from the subwoofer. Um, so the placement in the room is, is critical, mm. mainly for modal behavior, uh, which is room acoustics. Yeah. Um, on top of that, we have time alignment issues. Um, so you need to find a compromise between time alignment and modal behavior. Mm. And to fully explain that, it's going to be more than two minutes. Yeah, Christopher's episode was uh, 32 minutes, so it's a big, big topic. Yeah. But are there any uh, hints or points or, or things to think about that, that we could explain in a couple of, uh, of minutes here? Yeah, um, time alignment. Uh, definitely you want to time align the signals between the subwoofer and your main speakers. Mm. Uh, you can do that in the processor, uh, our bigger subwoofer. You can do that inside the subwoofer as well for a stereo system. That's really going to help. Mm. Um, to think about room modes, um, there's lots of information about room modes available on the internet. Mm. So you can position your subwoofer to kind of uh, ameliorate the blur the room modes mm. and i know that you can use more subwoofers to help out and but that adds another set of of things to worry about i i guess yeah the uh, with more subwoofers you can position them differently in the mm. room so you activate or cancel room modes differently mm. so it gives you another layer of control yeah um so you can control the room modes with position and acoustic treatment mm. And then you need to think about time alignment to make sure everything adds up properly. And, and going back to the time alignment thing, uh, you were talking about you can use processors. The, uh, our bigger subs, they have presets that help you out. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any of that stuff, I guess it's again, uh, I remember the first episode you won, we talked about the, uh, the circle around you, yep. the equilateral triangle. It's about getting the subwoofer in line with all of that stuff, right? Exactly. You want so If you don't have any delay mm. available uh, or room control available, um, get your subwoofer in line with your speakers. And that means just the same distance same away? Same distance away, yeah. yeah. Ideally in front of you, but if you have to put it behind you, it's maybe not so bad. But Maybe not so bad. So, yeah. so put it in front of you if you can. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And... I guess that's where we should close this topic because we could keep going for uh, for hours and hours, right? Yeah, we could go for a long time. Yeah, yes. we were yeah. talking about it took you four years to uh, to come to an understanding of it, so maybe we can't really cover it in a couple of minutes. No, no. not easily. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Stephen, we're, we are at our final question and it's from Renee, and he asks if you can comment on fast bass. What he means is that people often tend to believe that bigger drivers are slower than smaller ones. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer the kind of uh, tight bass or uh, booby bass instead okay. of fast and slow, but they're, they're kind of interchangeable. Mm. And just for my sake, can, yep. you, can you maybe define what you mean of, of fast and, and tight or slow and boomy yeah. bass? So I would say fast bass is like, that yeah. and boomy bass is bleh. okay. I get that. So uh, and yeah, generally, uh, you know, bigger drivers. We're back to BL from mm -hmm. earlier. From earlier, question. yeah. Um, you know, they tend to have different parameters, so the BL isn't as good, mm. and then they tend to just react a bit slowly, so okay. they don't have that snap, that tightness. Mm. And it's easier to achieve that with a smaller driver. Okay. Having said that, I've had heard some really slow and boomy small drivers, mm. like eight inches, but some really tight and fast drivers, um, particularly in PA, mm. like twenty-one inch driver. Pretty big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and 
you really need to hear that. You know, that's that's an experience all by itself. Okay. So just to, to sum it up here, uh, it, it doesn't really have uh, anything to do with the size of the woofer, but uh, of the control that the amplifier has over the uh, the, the cone. Yeah, it's it's a it's an interaction of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, you're always going to have uh, to move a, a, a fair amount of air. Um, we talk about that in our white paper. You know, uh, volume velocity. Mm -hmm. You still have to do that. Yeah. Uh, but how you do that and the control you do that, you know, generally smaller drivers, it's easier to achieve mm -hmm. than on a bigger driver. Okay. So it's all the way back to the first question about the BL and watch that again, and then you. You get a little bit closer. Yep. Perfect. Steve, I feel like I've been uh, getting myself into some pretty big topics this time and the time before with uh, room acoustics. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> uh, but even still, I want to say thank you for, for being here today. It's been a pleasure. Same here. The next episode of Ask the Expert will be in January, so stay tuned for that and keep the great questions coming.